There you go. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good to see everybody. So glad you're able to be here today. I don't know if you are one of those people that does the countdown thing until Christmas, but if you were, you would know that there are 17 days until Christmas. Se- yeah, well, <laughs> that's great, right? <laughs> you know, 17 days until Christmas. And so, look, I want to kick off our time here together this morning by asking you a question. And it's actually the same question I asked you last week. And, and here's the question. What is it that you want this Christmas season? What is it that you hope and wish for this Christmas season? I think, I think probably some of you or most of us would say, well, you know, I, what I want this Christmas season is, is I wanna enjoy time with the people that I love. I wanna enjoy my family and I wanna enjoy my friends. I wanna have moments with them. Maybe for some of you, the thing that you're looking for, you'd say, man, you know, I'm looking forward to these parties and gift exchanges and things like that. But probably all of us, when you get underneath all the things we're excited about, I think what we really want are transcendent moments. I think what we really want this Christmas season are moments where we experience true, deep peace. We want moments that are marked by happiness. We want to experience deep true, authentic joy. I think for most of us, if we were to describe what we're hoping for this Christmas, we'd, we'd probably describe something that's a lot like a Norman Rockwell painting or, or perhaps a Thomas Kincaid painting. The problem is, is that when it comes to Christmas, most of us don't experience what we hope we experience. For most of us, there's a pretty sizable gap between what we hope for, what we long for, what we wish for, and then what we actually experience. You see, we hope for a Thomas Kincaid experience or a Norman Rockwell experience, but what we end up experiencing in reality is something like National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Okay, yeah, Christmas has such a way of being chaotic, doesn't it? And it it turns out so differently oftentimes than what we want. And so what we're doing is we are in a series that we have called uncluttered. We're titling it uncluttered. And the reason why we're calling it that is because what we're doing is we're talking about the gap. We're talking about the gap between what we hope for and what we want and how we, how we close the distance between the two. Last week, we kicked off our series by talking about how we unclutter our Christmas when it comes to our schedules. Because if we're not careful, by the time it's all said and done, every single one of us will start saying things like, I'm overwhelmed, I'm exhausted, I'm overscheduled. And so last week we talked about how we unclutter our schedules and the big takeaway from last week that I hope you walked away with was if we're gonna unclutter our schedules, we need to pursue the important things over the urgent things. We need to find a way to sort through all of the good options that are available to us at Christmas time and we need to pick the very best ones and do that. And if, by the way, if you weren't here last week or if you're starting to feel your Christmas schedule get cluttered, Let me encourage you, you can actually go back and you can watch that sermon online at crosswaychurch.com, crossway.news, or you can go to our YouTube channel and catch it there. Well, today, I want to talk about another area of our life that tends to get cluttered at Christmas time. It's an area of our life where, quite frankly, the gap between what we hope for and what we actually experience is, is, is pretty big. Today, I want to talk about how we unclutter our Christmas when it comes to our finances, If we are gonna unclutter our Christmas when it comes to our finances, I am convinced that what we're gonna need to do is we're going to need to tap into some of the subversiveness and some of the upside down nature of the way that the first Christmas was. When you start reading in Luke chapter one, you find the Christmas story, and, and the Christmas story begins with an angelic announcement about the arrival of Jesus. It's a moment that has been depicted in art all throughout human history, and it's normally serene and calm and kind of peaceful in nature, but it was actually, the actual incident itself was was rather subversive. It starts this way in Luke chapter one. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. I'm not sure how familiar you are with your ancient landscape, but Nazareth was really not an impressive place at all. In fact, you and I would probably describe it as a 
Podunk, one horse town, one of those towns that has, the, it's the, has just one flashing light in the center of town. It was a sleepy place. Absolutely nobody of importance ever lived there, and absolutely no, nothing of importance generally happened there. In, in fact, one of Jesus' contemporaries said, basically described the place this way. He said, can anything good really come out of Nazareth? But God in his wisdom, sends the message of Jesus' arrival to Nazareth. Now, this is completely different than probably what you and I would have done. If we were living in Jesus' time, we would probably do what we do now. We would search for the city that has one of the highest populations. Perhaps we would do a demographic study before we chose the city, and then we would choose a city where there were a lot of powerful and influential people there, and then we would launch a marketing strategy to try to get as many people to come as we possibly could. And and then when we did the event, we'd, we'd try to draw as big a crowd as we could so that when everybody heard the news, they could take it as far away as fast as they possibly could. This is the way that you and I would do it. But God's approach is different. It literally cuts against the grain of conventional wisdom. It's upside down compared to the way that you and I would do it. The story continues. In the next verse we read, he came to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So in this sleepy little town of Nazareth, there was a woman by the name of Mary that lived there. She's betrothed to a guy named Joseph. Betrothal is kind of like engagement in our world, but it's a whole lot more binding and a whole lot more serious. So she's betrothed to Joseph, and and she is the person that God picks to deliver the message to. You know, when universities and businesses and even churches like ours, when they have a a job opening, almost always what they do is they choose a search team. They form some sort of a search team. Sometimes it's called a search committee. And they take the first job of the search team or the search committee is to take a look at the job description. And then what they do is that the first task is to develop a list of qualifications, qualifications that they think that they are going to need for someone to fill that particular role, and then they go searching for it. Now, it's important for us to understand that what God's doing here is he is launching the biggest initiative in the course of human history. It is literally without precedent. He is coming to save the world. And so when the Father, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit got together and they looked at the job opening, who do we need to help us with this new, very important initiative? And, and what are the qualifications of all the people available? They pick Mary, a peasant. A peasant who lives in a podunk town in the middle of nowhere. They didn't pick somebody powerful or influential. They didn't pick a a priest or a politician. They picked a peasant. And in a world that was a male-dominated, male-saturated world, they also chose a woman. This is so different than the way the world worked in their day. In in Jesus' day, If you had a message of this magnitude, you almost never would take it to a peasant, and you would definitely not take it to a woman. But God did it so different. Now on top of that, God is about to tell this girl, this woman, Mary, who is a virgin, that that she's going to give birth to a son, and when she does, she's still going to be a virgin. Now that, that is completely opposite of the normal chronology of events, isn't it? That's just generally not the way things go. And I imagine for Mary, this was a pretty normal day. She probably got up that morning and was working and doing her morning chores, and and perhaps perhaps she's just daydreaming. She's daydreaming about Joseph, and she wonders what kind of a husband he will be, or or maybe she's thinking about her her color scheme for her wedding that's coming up, or or perhaps she's thinking about how she's going to decorate her first home, or, or maybe she's wondering about children and how soon they'll come along. But for Mary, this is a normal day. Nothing really probably stands out to her. She's just going about her business when the angel arrives. In the next verse we read, the angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, 
the Lord is with you. And then Mary was greatly troubled. And of course she was. Because an angel showing up to give you a message isn't a normal part of everyday life, is it? In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that probably none of us have ever had this happen. And by the way, if you have, come see me after service. I want to hear your story. I would love to hear about your angelic visit. But this isn't normal. And so she's troubled, but the the author goes on and says, and she wondered what kind of greeting this might be. He didn't just greet her in any general sort of way. There was a specific thing that he was communicating when he greeted her. One scholar once said that the greeting is similar to hail, fair lady. It was a, a regal sort of greeting. It was a greeting that you would greet somebody with who was someone who was important or somebody who had authority. And I'm sure as Mary is pondering this this greeting by the angel, she's thinking to herself, me? A lady? I mean, at this point in time, Mary is maybe 13, 14, 15, at most 16 years old. And as she wrestles with the greeting, it's as if the angel heard every word in her head. So he goes on and he he tells her, do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. That word favor is the same word grace, and it carries this idea that that God is giving her a gift, that she has received a gift or is about to receive a gift from God. Now, in the next verse, he explains, and he says, look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. And then the angel starts to describe what Jesus will be like and what he will do. And here's what the angel says. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. In the next verse we read, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and his kingdom will never end. Now this whole description is very, very important. And to understand the importance of it, you kind of have to understand the context into which these things were said. When when the angel says these words, the Jews are an oppressed people. They have been for a long, long time. Their, Their land is being occupied by Roman soldiers, and literally every governing official is either a representative of Rome or directly approved by and a friend of Rome. They're not slaves necessarily, but they're definitely being held hostage to Rome. Sure, Rome allows them to practice their religion, but but Rome taxes them heavily. And at every corner, at every turn, at every opportunity available, Rome reminds them that they are in charge. On top of that, there's economic oppression that's happening for the nation of Israel. In Palestine, during this time, there was no middle class. There were simply haves and have-nots. And and the haves were a very small, very select group of people that had a disproportionate amount of wealth, and literally everybody else was a peasant. Literally everybody else simply lived day-to-day, paycheck-to-paycheck, and if they were lucky, season-to-season. And because of this, for a long time, people have been dreaming, people have been hoping, people have been longing for a day, longing for a better day, a day where they would be free from Roman rule and and Roman occupation, a day when they would be independent and prosperous. And this is the way that it has been for a long time. And it's in the middle of all of that that a strange messenger shows up to a podunk town that nobody ever goes to, to a person that nobody would probably go to, and behind closed doors, he starts talking about a message about of of this guy, and he talks about thrones, and he talks about greatness, and he talks about a kingdom that will never end. The message that the angel delivered was incendiary in nature. This, in the Roman Empire, this was, would be considered to be a treasonous message. 
Because listen, the angel was talking about setting the nation of Israel free. This is nothing short of revolutionary. This is a big deal. Now the reason why it's important for you to understand that, that, the, that in the first Christmas, the context was all of this happened, it was subversive in nature, and it happened to a group of people that were oppressed and, and, and held captive. It's important for you to know that because I don't think you can actually experience or appreciate the first Christmas without it, but it's also important because I'm not sure if you can actually celebrate Christmas in 2019 without understanding that there are people in our world, just like in the ancient world, that are still oppressed and held captive. And the jarring part is, I would argue that probably you're the one who's being held captive. You see, I think in America, when it comes to Christmas time, most Americans are being held captive to a system of materialism and consumerism. If you don't believe me, just consider a few facts. This year, Americans are projected to spend $143.8 billion on Christmas. And that's a conservative projection. There are actually some people that are projecting that we will spend upwards of $1 trillion. On Black Friday this year, Americans spent $7.2 billion on Christmas. That's up 14% from last year. And then, a couple days later, on Cyber Monday, we spent $9.4 billion, setting an all-time record. We have never spent that much on Christmas on Cyber Monday ever before. And that number actually is up nearly 19% from last year. And I'm not sure how it's going to go this year, but in 2018, Americans racked up an average of little over $1,000 in debt per person. If the trend in numbers continue between last year and this year, it's likely that that number will be 1,100 or 1,200 in debt per person. We are being held captive to a system of materialism and greed and consumerism. And I, and I want you to know that this system that all of us find ourselves captive to, it's not by accident at all. This is not something that just happened accidentally. This thing was manufactured, it was designed. Marketers spend literally billions upon billions upon billions upon billions of dollars so that we spend and spend and spend and spend and spend during Christmas time. In fact, companies, what they do is they have very sophisticated, very intricate plans to try to keep you and me buying 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they are extremely good at their job. And along the way, they have, they've, they've convinced us of some things that just simply are not true. They've convinced us, for instance, that if you start buying early, that you spend less. When in fact, research indicates that people who start buying for Christmas before Thanksgiving, they actually end up spending more, not less. They've also convinced us that, that if we shop sales, that we'll spend less money, which also isn't true. In fact, people who shop sales end up spending more than people who pay full price. They've also convinced us that if we shop online, that we'll save money, which isn't true. Research also indicates that people who shop in physical store locations end up spending less than people who spend online. They've convinced us of all kinds of things that just simply are not true. But probably the most insidious thing that we have been convinced is that when it comes to Christmas, the measure of our love for someone is determined by how much we spend. 
That, that if people are going to be happy, if they're going to feel our love, then what they need is bigger, what they need is more, and what they need is a Christmas tree that has so many presents around it that it's spilling out into the room. You see, we have been duped. We have been duped into believing that in order to have a Merry Christmas, we need to spend, 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 buy, 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 more, 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 more. And it's not true. It's a lie. It's a lie that probably most of us are being held captive to, and it's a lie that makes our Christmases cluttered financially. Now, I think Jesus knew this was going to be a system, a way that some, t- some people down the road, 2,000 plus years, would find themselves captive to. So he warned about this stuff on a fairly regular basis. In one instance, he said this. He said, look, no one can serve two masters. In other words, Jesus says, look, it's, it's not, he didn't say, look, you shouldn't try to serve two masters. He didn't say, look, most people can't serve two masters or can't pull it off. What he says is it's impossible. No one can serve two masters. And then he gives a little bit of an explanation. Either you will hate the one and, and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and you'll despise the other. You cannot, he reemphasizes, and then becomes more specific about what he means, you cannot serve both God and money. That word money there in some of your Bibles reads mammon. Mammon is a word that kind of means money, but it also is expanded, and it means money and stuff. What God's saying is, is you can't serve both God and stuff. You can't serve God and buy into consumerism and greed and materialism. On another location, another place, Jesus says, look, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Well, why, Jesus? Well, look, moths and, and vermin destroy and, and thieves, they break in and steal. He says, look, you gotta be careful about materialism, you gotta be careful about consumerism because if that's what you make your life about, those things are temporary and they fade. But perhaps Jesus' most stark warning comes in a, in a very a different setting where he had been teaching to a large crowd of people all day, and he'd been teaching about some pretty important subjects, and in the middle of his teaching, there was a guy in the crowd who interrupted Jesus' teaching to try to get Jesus to settle a domestic dispute between him and his brother. Apparently, his brother wasn't sharing his inheritance with him in the way that the guy felt like was right, and so he tries to get Jesus to intervene. Jesus, as, the, as he watches this man make a plea for Jesus to do something, he sees right through what's happening. And he can tell this man's heart is being driven by greed. This man's heart is being driven by materialism. This, this man's heart is being driven by consumerism. And so Jesus turns to the entire crowd as he directs and he says what he's about to say. And here's what he says. Watch out. You can almost feel the intensity in Jesus' voice. Jesus is so serious about what he's saying now. Watch out, and then in case we missed it, he warns us again, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. In other words, what Jesus is saying is you got to be careful with greed and materialism and consumerism because it's sneaky. It makes its way into our heart. It makes its way into our life, and we don't even know that it's there. And then he says, look, and it comes in different shapes and forms. And if Jesus were standing here today, I think what Jesus might say is sometimes it even looks like the Christmas season. And then Jesus makes this statement. He says, look, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions, which seems kind of like a strange thing to say right? Because it seems kind of obvious. I mean, I don't know too many people that I've, I've encountered in my life that says, look, really when it comes down to, to what life really means, it's really just about the stuff that I got. Most of us, some point in the conversation, even if we like to pursue stuff and we like nice things and all that sort of stuff, we finally come around to acknowledging something, even if we don't live by it, we say, yeah, well, people are the most important thing. So it seems strange that Jesus would say it, because it's kind of obvious. Why do you think Jesus said that? Why do you think he felt the need to state the obvious? Perhaps 
it's because he knew that about 2,000 years later, during the Christmas season, we would live as if it isn't true. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not trying to be the Grinch that stole Christmas. And I know it kind of feels like that, I'm sure. I want you to know, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with buying gifts during the Christmas season for people that we love. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with decorating our house and enjoying the season and doing all of that. But, but I want to be clear. When all of this is said and done, there are certain things that none of us will say. There's certain things, there's certain phrases that will not come out of our mouth. For instance, nobody's going to say this. I love how my kids don't play with most of what I got them for Christmas. Nobody says that. You know what we do say? I just drives me nuts that I spent all this money, went through all this time, and did put in all this effort, and I bought toys for my kids that literally most of them, they don't even play with five minutes later. But nobody says this. And there's a reason why. There's a reason why people don't say this. Also, people won't say this. None of us will. I'm so much closer to God and my spouse because we overspent on Christmas. Nobody says that. And what I want you to understand is there's a reason why we don't say this. When we buy into the system, when we become captive to materialism and consumerism, it doesn't set us free. It doesn't give us what we long for. It doesn't, it doesn't deliver what we're pursuing. It won't close the gap. Also, something people never say. My Christmas debt makes me feel so much peace and joy. People don't say that. Nobody looks at their, their credit card statement and goes, man, you know that interest I'm paying? Mm. I'm having a spiritual moment right now. Just so much peace and joy. Nobody says that. And what I want you to understand is there's a reason why. When you and I are captive to the system, materialism, greed, consumerism, when we're captive to it, it clutters our life and our Christmas every single time. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we get over it? How do we break free? Well, I have just one idea I wanna drop on you this morning. In, in my opinion, it's one of the best ways to break free and unclutter your Christmas financially, and here's what it is. Spend less to help more. Let me reiterate one more time. There's absolutely nothing wrong with buying presents for people that you love. There's absolutely nothing wrong with spending money or decorating your house or, or doing any of that, but, but surely we can find a way to spend less to help more. If, we spend, if you spend to the point where you don't have any to help people, something's wrong. If you spend to the point where you actually, even worse, you go into debt and you can't help people, something is wrong. You've bought into the system and you're gonna clutter your Christmas up. I just believe that all of us can do this. We'll have to be intentional and we'll have to be creative, but, but surely all of us can do this, right? We'd have, we're gonna have to be intentional. We're gonna have to, you need a spending plan, by the way, for Christmas. Spending plan is like a new way, kind of a PC way of saying budget, but you need one of those. If you, you have not looked at your finances and determined this is what I can reasonably spend this Christmas, you will, you're, you're, not, you're, you're gonna be a slave to the system. You really will. And by the way, if you have a budget but you're not tracking your spending as you spend, you're also gonna end up a slave to the system and a cluttered Christmas. You need to be intentional, but also we need to be creative. Maybe you could just decide this Christmas, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy one less present so I could help somebody. Or, or maybe you could look at your, your budget for Christmas and you could say, well look, I'm gonna take 2% of my budget or 5% of my budget or maybe even 10% of my Christmas budget and I'm gonna use it to help somebody in need. 
And look, I know when I start talking about this, there are many of us in this room who we have kids, right? And, and, and Christmas, there's these expectations, and we love our kids, and we want to express our love to our kids during Christmas time by buying them gifts. But what if, what if you decided just to give them one less gift? If you gave them one less gift, would their Christmas be less merry? Perhaps in order to spend less, in order to give more, you might have to, for somebody in your life, rather than buying them a, a trinket, another cup or mug or candle that they don't really want, maybe you made them something. Or, or I don't know, I know there's a number of ways to push back on the materialism this Christmas. I know some people who say when it comes to their kids, they're like, we're going to give them three gifts because that's what the, Jesus got from the wise men. I know other people that have categories. Okay, we're going to give them something, that they, something they need, something to read, something they want, and they have these all little categories. But you need to find a way to spend less to help more this Christmas season. Otherwise, it'll just end up the way it's always ended up. Let me share with you for a moment how my wife Stacy and I plan to do this. We, we, we put a budget together, and then we took a portion of our Christmas budget, and we said, yeah, we're going to use this amount. We're, we're not going to buy more presents for our kids than they, they actually need. We're just going to take this amount. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to World Vision's website. And I don't know if you've ever been, you know, I don't know what you know or don't know about World Vision, but there's an incredible humanitarian organization that does amazing work all around the world. And on their, on their website, you have the power and ability to purchase certain things for different people around the world. You can purchase mosquito nets, you can purchase vaccinations, you can purchase meals, uh, you can even purchase livestock, chickens, goats, cows, things like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to search through the options of what we can buy for people around the world, and we're going to try to match it up with things that we believe that kind of would meet, kind of touch on the way our kids would do it. And then on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve, when we open gifts, what we're going to do is we're going to, that's going to be part of what we open. And as a family, we're going to talk about, hey, look, there are people in our world that don't have it nearly as good as we do. And, and they have needs that we don't have, needs that are going unmet. And so we decided that to give them this for Christmas, and, and this is how it's going to impact them, and this is how it's going to change their life. And then when it's done, we're going to remind our children that the reason why we're doing this is because Jesus came to be a giver, not a taker. I don't know what it looks like for you, but if you want to break free this Christmas, you need to find a way to spend less to help more. Unclutter your Christmas. Don't stay a slave to the system. Break free. Unclutter your finances. Spend less to help more.